started and we uh, thank you for coming to Miller and our series of mining the treasure house uh, lectures uh, I want to mention the next uh, public event that will be here at the library which will be on Tuesday night uh, September 29 from 6 to 7 o'clock and that is Virginia in verse uh, Michelle Boiso and John Castine who are both poets and who have written books of poetry will be here to discuss uh, their poetry books and so that's um, Virginia in verse on Tuesday, September 29th. Now we have something rather different from that today. Um, our speaker is Chris Colby, and Chris has been at the library since 1981, uh, and um, all of that has been spent in both archives description and archives uh, public services. And he is a native of Richmond. He attended uh, the other Mr. Jefferson's University, the College of William and Mary, and has a master's from the University of South Carolina. He has published extensively in the uh, Mesda Journal, which is the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts. Uh, he's going to speak today on a topic that he has been interested in for many years, and that is Virginia May, researching the Southern Decorative Arts through county and state records. Chris. Thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Our talk is going to be divided into three sections. The first is going to be a general overview, then a section on state records, followed by a section on local records. And we'll start off now with our introduction and I'll go to our next slide. Arts, summer 19, excuse me, 2003, the candlestick 
deposit pot and the bell, which also has the federal eagle on the back of it, are, are shown. So we'll go on to the next illustration that we have. We're going basically from 1807 to 1824-25. At that time, the Marquis de Lafayette was making his tour to the United States. And Virginia decided to have its main celebration in Yorktown for this revolutionary patriot. And they called on craftsmen, primarily from Richmond, to supply some of our the needs. And you see you've got William Cowan, a silversmith, supplying a dozen tablespoons, a dozen teaspoons, a plated caster, and a common plaster. I have never seen a clock like this in my life. It's one of the most bizarre things, but I think intriguing things, and it's got the weights up and down, which I think make it an interesting thing to look at. Um, the cost for this celebration was $10,000, which was a huge amount for the state to spend at that time. Sort of picking up on the visit of uh, Lafayette, was the Richmond cabinet maker James Rockwood. And we'll go to our next slide. Rockwood had Caleb Cook, an ornamental chair painter, paint four dozen chairs with the General Lafayette's coat of arms with an eagle upon it. And he also supplied Cook two books of gold leaf. So these chairs, which are called fancy chairs, probably were working alive and just gleaming with, with color. Some of the other things he did were lettering three canteens for the blues, that's the Richmond Blues, a militia group uh, that would have been active during this time period. But like is not all silver teaspoons or fancy chairs. In 1838, the county officials of Mecklenburg County were erecting a new courthouse. And they were interested in something that was useful, that you could count on, that was practical. And we'll go to that next item. <clears throat> they got Thomas Johnson, the start of a three-generational chair-making family, to make six chairs furnished for the courthouse at that time. And what did these chairs look like? And you can see those in the next slide. These are called Johnson chairs. They're the typical slapback chairs. You can find them in the natural color of the maple or stained in the Spanish brown. They've got sort of a unique finial with a button on top. Uh, they're extremely well-made chairs. They would have been in public places, they would have been private homes, unless you think these are poor folks chairs, it's important to realize that a set of six chairs was obtained in the mid-19th century by Judge Beverly Tucker, who lived in his father's house, St. George Tucker, in Williamsburg. These were probably picked up because he was a judge, he was a lawyer when he was doing the circuit. So these are useful everyday items that were made here in Virginia. The next slide deals with a note from Charles Bosher, a Richmond coachmaker, addressed to Alexander Poirier, a Richmond coachmaker. I wish to employ your man Dick to do my painting. I shall give him piecework, and as the job goes out, you shall receive your money. And I've chosen this to illustrate the influence of African-American artisans in Richmond and in the South. Dick was a slave that belonged to Alexander Poirier. You also have free people of color who are artisans in the Richmond area, artisans in the South, and are important in a interracial workplace that existed. I think we'll now go on to our state records. And I've chosen sort of as our little image, the phoenix rising from the ashes. This is Charles, yeah, it's appropriate today, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Charles Spencer, 
Charles Spencer was a merchant in Richmond, and he had sold goods to primarily metalwork, the Virginia Manufactory of Arms. The Auditor of Public Accounts was established in 1791, and the records of the office span the period 1776 to 1928. All claims for reimbursement from the Commonwealth were handled by the Auditor for Public Accounts. Auditors would present, excuse me, artisans would present vouchers for good or services provided, and the auditor's office would verify the claim and a warrant was sent to the treasurer's office for payment. The highest concentration of records dealing with artisans for the state come from the contingent fund, which is made up of a series of vouchers. They cover the span 1776 to 1859, and they're arranged chronologically. You've got 23 feet 9 inches of these things, so there's a huge number of them. Let's look at one of these vouchers. Okay, please note the date. This is for Robert Poor, a Richmond cabinet maker, to bring in the inverse for $170, slight notation for making presses and tables for the executive. Let's flip over the next part of the voucher, and this shows the detail. This is what you're after. To a mahogany book press with glass doors. For a mahogany book press with panel doors. To eight small tables. Um, you can go through the contingent fund literally plowing through the papers. That's one way to approach it. But another way to approach it is to go into the auditor's account books, what we call entry 36, which are warrant books. And we'll look at a page there. You could have gone to the warrant book, gone to the date, Robert Poor making presses and tables, and then gone back to the loose papers if you want to approach it that way. But there is a problem with this sometimes, as we'll see in the next slide. This voucher is for Joseph Danforth. He is not an artisan. He is a general contractor who is handling a number of things that were being done for the state at that time. When we flip to the next slide, this is what's important. To cash paid Patrick Houston for repairing the table uh, and lot in the council room. If you had gone to that volume, this voucher would be listed under Danforth's name, not under Houston's name. So if you use the volume first to go to those papers, realize that there could be a problem with this process. The next group of state records that we're going to go to are called, and we're going to look at the computer in just a minute, are the Capital Square Data Records, or Entry 655, covers the period 1784 to 1931. It's an artificial collection assembled from several sources, such as the Contingent Fund. And we have an EAG guide, and I'd like to show you how you get to it from our website so that you can do this out yourself. It's very descriptive. We're going to go to catalog. Archives and manuscripts. Title begins with, and that's critical. Series. We're going to be going to series 
B, which is for the mansion, I believe. vouchers and we're going to be looking at box excuse me four folder four and now we're going to refer it back to what you will find an example of one of the vouchers that you would find in there again this was for the cabinet maker Robert Core and you find such things as making two large bureaus two mahogany bedsteads one circular washstand, pair of claw card tables, claw tea tables, four dressing glasses. Now, I'd like to go and show you what we mean by claw table. It refers to the feet, as we'll see in the next slide. This is a claw card table made by Robert Ford. It's documented to 1832. So this gives you while we were looking at something in the 1820s, the style is basically the, the same. It might have been a little wider as far as the actual, uh, what it looked like. This particular image is found in the article uh, in the Journal of Early Southern Doctrine of Arts, winter 2005 to winter 2006, entitled Society of Journeyman Cabinet Makers of Richmond, Virginia. Okay. We're then going to go into local records. That means the counties and state. Whoops, excuse me, let me go back. When I had, I had processed the auditor's material, and I thought, and made copies, and I thought, how can this be best used? So I set up a, a database, and this is a printout that was used in an article in the Journal, Journal of Early Southern Decorative Arts. As you can see, it's alpha by the name of the artisan. Here again, we've got this one, Rider Four Claw Tea Table, entry number 655 from the Audit for Public Accounts, Box 4, Folder 4. We've got the Journal of Early Southern Decorative Arts up in the West Reading Room or Research Room for you to use. And this will give you all of the things that I collected basically up to about 1840 in an alphabetical listing by the name of the artisan. Uh, a short entry to what they made, uh, the date that it was done, where it was done, most of it is written, but there are some other localities, and where it can be found. Okay, so we'll go on to the state and local records. This image of a little slap back chair came from the inside cover to the index to judgments for Rockingham County. <laughs> and it's got some style there. You see how they scallop the ends of the slats there when they fit into the vertical parts. Now, we're going to stay here for just a second, and I apologize. I'm just going to have to lecture for a few moments, but I'll try to make it brief. Court papers come in two physical type of varieties. They can be bound in a volume, such as a will book or a deed book, or they can be loose. And we call these loose papers. And these papers go by several generic names. Court papers, judgments, ended causes, determined papers, ended law papers, common law papers, and dead papers. But we're going to be dealing with two specific types of legal documents, judgments, chancellors, and then minute and order books. The legal document called a judgment is the court's final determination of the rights and obligation of the parties in a legal case. The cases usually concern cases of death. The records in a judgment name the plaintiff slash creditor and the defendant slash debtor. The documents will state who is indebted to whom and for what amount. If the debtor was unable to meet his or her obligation, the court would order property to be seized in order to satisfy the debt. When accounts and receipts are contained in judgment, they may provide a wealth of information about goods and services provided by the artisans. Because documenting information and statements that explain the case may be written in various places, researchers need to examine both the front and the back of these documents. Access to a judgment is through the use of a minute or order book. 
the index is alpha by plane, if the arson you're researching is a defendant, and many of them were, then you read the entire index from left to right. In Virginia, the papers of the judgment follow the case until the court hands down a final decree, and it is that date you use to find the case. In other southern states, the papers do not follow the case, but are filed each time the case was heard in court. For example, North and South Carolina judgments are called common pleas. And then for the term chancery, chancery case was one which was so complicated that it could not be decided by written law, but by fairness. In North and South Carolina, they're called equity cases. The judge would appoint commissioners to decide the fair way to decide the case and report back to him. They contain three basic parts, a bill of complaint, the defendant's answer, and the final decree. While chancery cases could be heard in any court of the land, they are primarily found, depending on the time period, in the county or husting court, the superior court of chancery, the superior court of law and chancery, and the circuit court. Access to the chancery, as the, uh, the judgments, is by a minute or order book which provides you with the ended date. And finally, we're going to be talking about the minute or order books. In describing the process of finding a judgment or a chancery case, I've used the term order book. The minute or order books are volumes used by the clerk of court to record any action taken in court when it was in session. Technically, a minute book contains brief entries. It was used by the clerk as a starting point to go back to the loose papers and then write up a synopsis. This synopsis was recorded in an order book in a neater, hopefully a more organized form. These volumes are indexed internally. More rarely, there is a comprehensive index. Some courts have both a minute and an order book, and sometimes just one. Sometimes the clerks use the terms interchangeably. The important thing to remember it is the point of access to judgments and chancery. We're going to go to our next slide, and we're actually going to go through a uh, procedure. And we're going to be looking at a judgment from Richmond City Hustings Court. The plaintiff, by them, is Seth Haywood. He was a turner who, as early as 1825, who was working for Willis Cowling. Cowling died in 1828, and Haywood would eventually sue the executors for back wages. The access is through the minute book. This is the page in the minute book. Since Haywood is the plaintiff, you look under the letter H, but there are two entries for this case, the first one, and then if you go five up from the bottom, the second one, or the last one. It's that last entry you want. If you then go to the next slide, which is page 173, we get a date, May 29, 1832, Haywood versus Cowling's executors. Armed with that date, we can then go to the loose papers, which are arranged by year and by month. And when we do, we find the first of a long series of accounts presented by the Turner Seth Haywood. We can go to that slide now. Mr. Willis County says state. What we're going to find are references to turning child press columns, two small table pillars, 14 table legs, 12 hat pins, four high posts for a high post mahogany bed, four crib posts, four stumps, which refer to a stump foot on a chest of drawers or a case piece, four French posts, which refer to posts for a French bed, which would be like what we would call a sleigh bed. So there are a number of things here that can be found showing particular items that were produced. The next judgment that we're going to look at, we're not going to get there quite yet, let me give you some background. It's for a man by the name of Simon Schultz. He was a painter in the Richmond area. Examination of the order books for the county of Henrico, which surround the city of Richmond, revealed three suits for Schultz suing people for payments of debts. Again, you're going to go from the index 
to the actual page in the order book and then to the ended date. In February of 1797, he sued coachmaker Joseph Greaves for paying three coaches. In July of 1797, he sued General Daniel Truhart for the payment of nine drawings. Unfortunately, it is not clear what subject matter the nine drawings were or what meeting was he was using. But on the 5th of November, 1797, he sued William Truhart, and now we get an idea of what he was doing. A painting of Alexander the Great entering triumphant into Babylon. <laughs> <laughs> what might have been the source for this illustration? Well, various painters, such as Charles Le Brun and others, had painted this subject, but it's highly likely that Simon saw that painting. It's more likely that he saw a print. For example, a gentleman by the name of Gaspar Diziani, who died in 1767, had done a print of this particular type of subject, and it's more likely that that's what this painting is based on. I looked at the other painting, The View of the Meadow Bridges, and sometimes you try to make things just too daggone complicated. I was thinking this must have been based on some English print. And a friend at the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts contacted me and said, hey, Chris, you all have the Mutual Assurance Society policies. And guess what? There's a policy for Mr. Truhart. And it says the following. Daniel Truhart the, of the Meadow Bridges in the County of Hanover. This painting was a local landscape scene or a picture of True Hearts House, rather than something exotic that I was trying to make it to. <laughs> it's also interesting in 1797 that uh, there was a newspaper advertising Mr. Schultz's painting, four and a half feet by three and a half feet, representing Alexander's triumph and entry into Babylon. Now, I've mentioned before, usually, it's not the artisans who are set, uh, suing the person that they produce the item for. It's the other way around, and we'll see that in our next slide. James Yuhan was a musical instrument maker, and he had gotten into debt with a local mercantile firm, Blodgett and Eustace. So he tried to find a way to get out of the debt that he was going that he owed. And one way he was going to pay the subscription for the organ I, meaning you and me, at the church in Petersburg. Well, this is a very, very early entry. This is 1792 for an American organ to be made. The other things he was trying to do to get a debt was to repair the merchant's violin, two violin strings, to cash pay Mr. Edward for, Edwards for mending a drawer, and for repairing a harpsichord. The Next thing we're going to go into will be uh, Chancery, but I'd like to go into the database first to show you the Chancery database, and then we'll come back to this particular image. We're going to go to Virginia Memory. Records Index, we're going to do the County of Henrico. Some of these are in the original form, some have been filmed, and some are now scanned. And we're going to put in the bottom, I like that box I said of the name Mann. We're looking for Henry Mann, who was a cabinet maker in the late 18th century in Richmond, Virginia. <coughs> And we're going to scroll on down to the year 1805. And there's Henry Mann versus the patron John Syme. You can click on details. Gives you all the names of the parties involved. And as I said, some of these have been scanned and right goes in original form. If we go back to the actual page, man. 
notice that the debt was incurred in 1785, but it wasn't settled to 1805. Some of these things can be very long lasting. To a mahogany couch, to a Chinese tea table mahogany, to two elegant bedsteads mahogany. We've got some conspicuous consumption here. <laughs> and what we have below is the bread and butter of any sort of cabinet maker repairs. Two mahogany chairs with two new open backs and top rails and stretchers. They must have had one hell of a fight at the head. <laughs> two mahogany tea waiters and a shaving box for repairing a clock case to a card table with a new pair of brass hinges. <coughs> so in summation, the main records for state records are the contingent fund and the capital square down. The main records for the county and uh, city records are going to be judgments and chancery. And even though the examples I have shown you to go to the order or minute book with the end of date and then go to the loose papers deal with artisans dealing with the decorative arts, you can do the same thing for architectural history, and you can do the same thing in the contingent fund for architectural history. Don't think that the Capitol Square Dow contains there all that there is. That's an artificial collection, a lot of which was pulled from the contingent fund. Uh, so there are a variety of sources that you can, can get into. Now I've sort of danced on for a while, and I'm going to open up the floor for any of you if you've got questions about what I've said, uh, to explain it further, or if you want to go on to another subject, we'll try to do that. So I'll open it up to you. You can fire away. All right, Charles. What magnificent material. I'm just dazzled. There's a lot of gold in these walls here. <laughs> it takes a lot of sweat to get to it sometimes. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, I'm reading uh, uh, Dolly Madison's correspondence, mm -hmm. and she refers to things after, of course, they had that little business with the bridge, needing furniture. And um, she says, I'd really like to get my hands on those Eustace chairs. Does anybody have those Eustace chairs? Who finds these Eustace chairs? Whoever Eustace was, I'm guessing you know. And she wants those chairs, plus she wants some furniture from France. Plus she wants, so it's almost like reading her letters, too, you get a little bit of an idea. She's picking, she's pulling, she's begging, she's borrowing. And, um, and it makes you wonder, wouldn't it be fun to kind of put together a collective? And it looks like you could do that with a lot of this. You could. You can. Um, the same thing that I did for the database for the contingent fund, I could do for Richmond City, Henrico, and parts of Chesterfield. I'll put that in a database. In fact, I'm talking to some people on personal papers about doing something like that. Where I've tried, I've gone through the judgments, I've gone through the end of causes, made copies, and you could, could do a database for just the uh, artists to deal with the decorative arts. You could do you could like take your terms and get some photographs together. Could do, yes. Any other questions that I can answer for y'all? Yes, sir, I'm going to go to the back and then to Brent. The uh, first couple of sides where you mentioned Thomas Johnson in Mecklenburg County. Yes, sir. That date, was that date January 18th, 1838? Uh, I can tell you. I was just kind of writing fast, and we were going. Kind of yeah, I can tell you just a second. <coughs> uh, Jan January the first, eighteen thirty-eight. Uh, received from uh, William C. Wall six dollars for six chairs. First, signed Thomas Johnson. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. Yes, Brent. I'm curious, Chris. You've been working a lot in the Richmond stuff, obviously, in Rico and Chesterfield. Has anybody tried to survey this huge bunch of material to get some sense of the variety and density of population of different kind of artisans in Virginia? They there, been everywhere. Th there, there is a, um, the Journal of Early Southern Decorative Arts has done something like that, and they have a database. Uh, their database is based on bound volumes such as deeds, will books, order books, and newspapers. But they have not gone into the judgments and chantry and pulled that information statewide. And it really has to be done on a local basis 
I mean, there's no way to do it except to do like case studies and, and draw it out that way. Uh, and the best way to do it is go to the order books and then go to the, the loose papers, but it's, it's a long process, but there's nothing cumulative for the state except what uh, the Journal of Early Southern Directive Arts has done, which is three W's a dot mes a dot org, and it's the craftsman the database, and that only goes up to 1820. But um, does that answer your question? Well, I'm curious. Your sampling of this one area, does it suggest that uh, the prevalence of artisans in, in Richmond might have been five times what the mes the database sample from its limited number of resources, mm -hmm. ten times, or? I think you will find a similarity in names, but I think that you will find new names that they do not have. Um, you can frequently pick up, besides the master craftsman that ran a shop, his journeymen. They are really hard to get a hold of sometimes. Um, there, I did a, the last article I did was the Society of Journeyman Cabinet Makers, and that's the level just below um, the masters. And so there were a lot of names that were picked up in a, in a legal suit when they tried to form basically a, a union. Um, so there is more in the loose papers, much more to get. Uh, the judgments, I think, are a better bet uh, to get what you want. Most of cases dealing with debt can be handled by written law. Yes, there are some in chancery, but they're not as prolific because they don't really require that. But there is an awful lot of new information that can be gained from working those county records, or as we have in Virginia, when a city becomes incorporated, they can, uh, the city records, the Hustings Court records, an awful lot that can be done through them. It just, again, You've got to go through the order books, and sometimes if you've got a last name that's unusual, that's fine, but golly, if you're working on John Smith, it's going to be a tough road to hope, but you just keep on. What's the most interesting or surprising thing you've come across? There are two things that I came across, and one of them is not uh, related to a judgment or an order book. One, are the papers of a Richmond cabinet maker, Willis Cowling, who died in 1828. And I wrote an article for Mesda on Willis Cowling. It basically documents his business practices, particularly his business practices with New York City. He was buying mahogany, uh, metalwork from uh, New York City. He was buying pre-made furniture parts, such as carved feet, turned pillars, from New York City. And he wasn't the only one involved. Robert Ford was another one. So that it's <coughs> possible that you could find a Richmond-made chest of drawers, mahogany, secondary uh, wood, southern yellow pine, but you could have carved feet from New York City on it. And all this comes about because you begin to have national competition. And the cabinet makers are thinking, how can I cut costs and keep on going? Um, the other thing that I thought was important was the legal case for the Society of Journeyman Cabinet Makers, which is the last thing I did an article on. In 1832, a newspaper article appeared in the Richmond paper where these journeymen wanted to band together to form what we would now call a union. The term that they used at that time was a combination. And what they were saying was, we want you to boycott any master's shop, any master cabinet maker's shop, who employs either slaves or free people of color. Uh, and the end result was they went to two cabinet maker shops, Robert Poor and George Henry's shop, and they tried to convince the white journeyman to leave the shop. Um, gentle persuasion didn't work in one case, and they ended up cracking somebody on the head, and that's when the courts came in to play with this situation. 
a little bit later, there is another case in the Richmond City Records, 1835, with a cabinet maker from New York, so-called cabinet maker, who runs an article in the Richmond newspaper and, and says, I've got the best uh, cabinet way around, better than these local people, I can offer them at the best prices. Well, this just starts a war in the newspaper because everybody gets angry with each other and they start revealing what they're, how they operate. And one of the things that uh, comes out is that uh, there's a lawsuit against this Yankee from New York because he has apparently slandered some of the local Richmond cabinet makers. And again, it's all sort of played out in the newspapers and the angrier they get, the more they tell you. Probably think they don't want you to tell them. And it turns out that this guy has come from New York. He's really a chair maker, but um, he is basically buying goods from New York, selling them in Richmond. The locals say he's panning, you know, shoddy goods made in sweatshops in New York to any Virginian who's foolish enough to buy the stuff. Uh, so those, I think, the Willis Cowling papers, which document the interaction between Richmond and New York. Uh, New York and Philadelphia had a huge influence on the coastal trade, and local cabinet makers were having to face not only competition internally in Richmond, but having the market flooded by these foreign, or excuse me, goods from the north. I <laughs> <laughs> had to deal with that. Um, one way some of these people deal with it is they retreat from the Tidewater area and they move inland to places like Lynchburg or Lexington. And they can do that for a while, but eventually it, it catches up with them. And then you also have the whole advent, again because of economic pressures, of industrialization in this lawsuit in the 1830s in Richmond. In the newspaper, the people say, well, this New York man, the goods are made by machines. And he writes back in the newspaper and said, well, hello, guys. Something is dawned, and you better get with it. And uh, so you've got the competition that is existing. You actually have that first thing we saw about the slave dick who was doing the work, piecework, rather than being paid by a particular amount of time. You're doing piecework. The item that you began was the item that you finished. In the 1830s, because of the industrialization, you don't have necessarily people beginning and ending things. You have sort of an assembly line thing, particularly in the larger urban areas in the north, but it's beginning to creep into the southern cities too, and it eventually will, will take over. So the whole artisan um, setup of master craftsmen, journeymen, and apprenticeship begins to disintegrate. And as the disintegration begins, and people feel socially and economically threatened, they lash out in a variety of ways, not unlike the economic situations of today. Mm -hmm. um, so those, I think, are the key things that, that I think I'm using the Richmond City Records. Yes, sir. You had mentioned how using the order of the minute books uh, gave you a point of access to the court records in the newspapers. Right. Um, could you review again or expand on the best way to start searching in the massive you could go to these volumes in entry 36 and 35 if you know the name of the craftsman. You could go by it that way. Or if you have a starting point from another record, go to the other way. Thing. But for the contingent fund, because it is simply chronological, it's just rolling up your sleeve, grit your teeth, and plowing through that thing and processing it. There would be days when I would find nothing and I was thinking, I'm freezing on stack three or four in the old building. Why am I here? <laughs> but then you find that one nugget, and as you begin to put the nuggets or the pieces together, then the picture begins to unfold. But the contingent fund is a hard thing to go through. There's no doubt about it. I mean, because, you know, you've got people being paid for uh, supplying stationery, for cleaning the hearths in the capital, and it has nothing to do with the decorative arts, you know. Um, one of the things that is, I found at one point in the uh, state records there, 
probably know your finished lunch, I can mention it. <laughs> Underneath the, uh, the staircase to the castles was uh, the men's room, so to speak, and they had a lead grate underneath there, and they needed to replace it. So people that made the lead grate submitted their voucher, and some wise person in the state said, don't you think that's a little bit expensive for this? And somebody sort of countermanded his statement and said, considering the work, I think it's a bargain. <laughs> and um, so the contingent fund is, is, contains a lot of information that could, requires an awful lot of determination to, to do. You know. uh, just follow up to that, would there be any different approach to the contingent fund records that are available after the Civil War period as opposed to before? The contingent fund goes up to 1859, and as you approach closer to the 1850s, it, it seems to dwindle in the type of things that are there. And I don't know totally the answer. I think they probably are a down volume. Obviously, the state was still requiring goods and services, but how they are reported is not reported the same way. I think, and I mentioned some volumes that you were looking look at, that they might be in there. But sort of my interest uh, wanes by about 1840. Some of this stuff just is too uh, daggone clunky for me to particularly like. But that doesn't mean that other people don't. <laughs> you isn't out of the holder. I think there's another method, and I think it's going through some of these disbursement uh, by to do that. I don't know if you've had any luck with it or not. Yeah. You know, but it, it's it's different and it's difficult for that time here. Okay. If there are no other questions, I'll let you go finish your lunch or throw tomatoes or whatever you want. <laughs>
Uh, but um, the key. <laughs>